We all want our games to be realistic, but there are certain suspensions of reality we take for granted, like being able to hide behind a wall and wait for the red on your face to go away to heal, or not having to take a break when your character needs the bathroom. Yes. I mean, most of the time. Sometimes though, games hit us with a dose of reality when we least expect it, leaving us hopelessly ill-prepared to deal with the consequences because, hey, we thought we were playing a video game over here. Here are seven times we had to deal with a video game being more realistic than we expected. Enjoy. Any idea where to start looking? It could be anywhere. Most likely, he's nestled up close to the Athenians. We've sent out a couple of patrols, but they never returned. And we can't spare any more men at this time. Sometimes you're better sending a woman anyway. The world of warfare changed forever on the day someone said, hey, what if we took these arrows we're shooting and set them on fire? That person's name was Jerry Fire Arrow, and the rest is history. Of course, you are the direct beneficiary of this innovation in the Fletcher's art, especially when playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey, where you can craft fire arrows, which are like regular arrows, only much more deadly, and likely to cause big distracting fires. The problem is that Assassin's Creed Odyssey's dedication to realistic fire physics can be as bad for you as it is for your enemies, as we discovered when we try to combine our love of firing fire arrows at people with our love of being stealthy and hiding in bushes. Knock a fire arrow while in a dry bush and you'll quickly discover that holding fire next to what is essentially kindling has the exact same result in Assassin's Creed Odyssey as it would in real life. I need to- No 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 no! Ah, Suddenly, your safe hiding spot is a blazing conflagration that A, will kill you if you don't move, sharpish, and B, is now acting as a fairly obvious beacon as to your current whereabouts. Caught that light! Oh, Enjoy ah. Maybe this is what Greek fire was. Makes sense why everyone agreed to forget about it. The title of Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is not, as you might expect, a metaphorical reference to lead character Naked Snake being hunted by someone. It's not even a literal reference to something coming to eat him. Instead, it refers to how Snake has to eat things he finds in the environment to survive. Things that are occasionally actual snakes. <laughs> Believe it or not, this isn't even one of the more confusing aspects of the Metal Gear Solid fiction. The survival mechanic is a key element of the game, with injuries persisting until they're cured and sustenance required to keep you alive in the jungle. That means you often have to break off from saving the world to stuff your face with berries or something. Mm. Ah. Hey, this works. Occasionally on your culinary tour of the Soviet Republic, you'll end up accidentally eating spoiled or rotten food and you won't have the digestive medicine in order to prevent food poisoning, which will decrease your health until you eventually puke the rotten chow back up. Food poisoning is caused by eating poisonous food. When you have food poisoning, your life will continuously decrease. If left untreated, you'll eventually throw up whatever it was you ate. There is a semi-secret and totally logical way to hurry the process up though, which will minimise the amount of health you lose. Spin the character model of Naked Snake around in the medical screen in nauseating circles and you'll make him realistically dizzy, so that when you switch back to the main game, he'll heroically throw up on his own shoes. Wonder if his stealth ability is compromised by the faint whiff of sick. Alright, it's not particularly elegant, but it will be useful in a pinch, particularly if you develop a taste for the forbidden fruit that is the poison dart frog. Ugh, poison. Damn. Clue was sort of in the name, Snake. You'll be pleased to hear that PSP spin-off sequel Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker did make finding non-poisonous sustenance a little bit easier with the addition of sealed, branded convenience food. In the Japanese version of the game, you could order your R&D team to invent cans of Mountain Dew the size of your head and enormous bags of Doritos. Though to be fair, if you ate a whole sharing bag of fish taco flavoured Doritos all to yourself, washed down with a gallon of Mountain Dew in real life, I probably wouldn't even have to spin you around. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the most realistic Zelda yet, adding a bunch of mechanics that mimic the real world, such as weapon degradation, rocks becoming slippery and hard to climb when it's wet, and our total inability to cook anything edible or appetizing. <laughs> uh. 
Of course, Breath of the Wild is still a video game, so what we're left with is an odd blend of video game logic and real-world concerns like the fact that you have to refuel your teleporting stone motorcycle. It was this grey area that led us to believe that the game's regular thunderstorms were nothing to be feared. Maybe even something to be looked forward to because they look incredible even if they do make it a total pain to try and climb anything. Unfortunately for you, this is one of those times where Breath of the Wild decides to be realistic about you running around in a lightning storm with a bunch of metal equipment in a game that includes plenty of wide open fields in which you are the tallest thing for quite some distance and you can probably see where this is going. Continue running around with what is essentially a giant makeshift lightning rod in your hands or strapped to your back and you'll start to see sparks appearing on your gear. Ignore these telltale warning signs and you will be straight up struck by lightning for a whopping 12 hearts of damage, easily enough to kill you outright in the early part of the game. Wow, I haven't felt this betrayed by Metal Gear since it turned out Acid was a collectible card game. The Moon is 385,000 kilometers from Earth, which is why it looks so small and we hardly ever go there. Because that's a long way to travel, friends. Even at the speed of a human spacecraft, it is a deeply inconvenient commute. If only we had some kind of portal gun, then we could nip up there for a weekly game of low gravity moon basketball. We observe this exact portal-powered moon journey taking place at the end of Portal 2, when protagonist Shell, who has some kind of portal gun, shoots a first portal onto the floor below her blundering AI nemesis Wheatley, Do not press that button! Do not do it! And a second portal onto the extremely distant surface of the moon. Oh, you had to play bloody cat and mouse, didn't you? While people were trying to work! The moon portal then immediately sucks you, Wheatley, and everything else within sucking rage straight to the surface of the moon, thanks to the disparity in pressure between the surface of the Earth and the moon's atmosphere of almost vacuum. Let go! We're in space! Which is all quite excellent, but also in this sequence, the most inspired piece of unexpected scientific realism is hidden in plain view. The developers of Portal 2 made the assumption that the portal gun shoots portals at the speed of light, as is their prerogative as the developers of Portal 2. The speed of light in a vacuum, meanwhile, is very nearly 300,000 kilometers per second. With the average distance to the moon being, as mentioned, 385,000 kilometers, and time being distance divided by speed, it therefore takes about 1.28 seconds for a portal fired from the Aperture Science handheld portal device to reach the moon. And then it takes another 1.28 seconds for the light from the portal opening on the moon to reach your eyes back on Earth. Which is why there is a scientifically accurate delay of 2 times 1.28 seconds which equals 2.56 seconds between you firing a portal at the moon and the cheeky twinkle that tells you that it's worked. Yeah. Interestingly, early playtesters were so used to portals appearing instantly when you fired them that they weren't ready for this scientifically accurate realism and would look away from the moon thinking it hadn't worked before the two and a half seconds had elapsed. So Valve had to lock the camera in place to make it obvious what was going on. What? Are you still alive? You are joking! Also interestingly, actual travel through a portal is clearly instantaneous, which of course indicates that the portals themselves enable faster than light travel, which in turn violates the fundamental notion of causality and excitingly means that the portal gun is also, technically, a time travel gun. It really is the gift that keeps on giving. Can you tell Jane wrote this? Thanks, Arthur. Okay, come on. In the majority of video games, it's best not to think about how exactly your character is carrying 13 different guns on their person and yet is still able to do, well, anything at all.
Like a crotchety old-time prospector, however, Red Dead Redemption 2 has had enough of this nonsense, and if you don't pay attention, it's going to be you who ends up paying for it. As you'd expect from a game with real-time hair growth, realistic horse testicles, and you probably don't need a third thing after realistic horse testicles, Red Dead Redemption 2's ruthless dedication to realism also extends to the amount of weaponry Arthur Morgan can carry on his person. While you will amass quite the collection of firearms by the end of the game, for the most part these fancy shooting irons are stored on your horse, and you have to manually decide which ones you want to take with you on missions. You're limited to two pistols and two long guns, mostly due to the similarly limited number of hands you possess. Of course, usually when we're playing Red Dead Redemption 2, we forget that this fastidious dedication to carrying capacity exists, and we'll merrily jump into a mission without having selected our weapons beforehand. The exact moment we realize this is when we're crouched in cover with an army of outlaws descending on us and reach for our trusty bolt-action rifle, only to realize we left it on the horse and now have only a revolver to defend ourselves with. You either a knockdown, drag out gunfight that takes way longer than it needs to, or us frantically whistling for our horse and hoping he has the bravery to come to our aid when we need him the most. Man, that's one brave horse. You really have to admire his cojones. I mean, because they're so realistic. Okay, good. Now that you're mobile, let's see if you can handle something kinetic. UFLL's got a small outpost half a click north of here. I don't much care for them being in my front yard. Root them out and kill them. There are two meanings of the term RPG. One is a role-playing game, like say Dungeons & Dragons, where you assume the role of a character and make decisions in a rich, involving, collaborative story. I turn into a cat. <laughs> I pick up Merowyn the cat, and I hurl Merowyn the cat directly at Giles. The other type is a rocket-propelled grenade, which is a grenade with a rocket attached to it. Don't get the two mixed up, otherwise it's going to make a real mess of tabletop night. The rocket-propelled grenade launcher is a staple of video game first-person shooters, so it was no surprise to see the weapon show up in Far Cry 2. Alright, it looks like it's been buried in a hole for 30 years, but at least you got your hands on it relatively early in the story. Far Cry 2 is a rare occasion where you're entrusted with one of the most powerful weapons in the game while you're still trying to remember which button was Sprint. There is a slight caveat though. Far Cry 2 has a realistic weapon durability system. Poorly maintained, rusty weapons are prone to jamming and misfiring at inopportune moments, like when you're single-handedly taking on an entire outpost full of mercenaries in a war-torn African state, just to pick a random example off the top of my head. It's bad enough when it's your assault rifle jamming. It's much worse when you fire your rocket-propelled grenade only for it to plop out at your feet and start spinning around. And that, my friend, is why you never return to a lit firework. To make matters worse, unlike the unrealistically flame-resistant level architecture of most first-person shooters, you're surrounded by African scenery that is drier than a mouthful of saltine crackers. So not only has your rocket exploded at your feet, you're also likely setting light to nearby trees, shrubs, and, surprise, the very grass you're standing on. I've made a terrible, terrible mistake. In further bad realism news, Far Cry 2's Dunia engine was built specifically to offer realistic fire propagation that created convincing out-of-control wildfires. These wildfires were even accurately affected by wind speed, making the entire place more flammable than a shell suit factory. Never had to put up with this shit in Dungeons & Dragons. I cast quit game. According to the laws of video game physics, gravity might be your enemy, but water is your friend. That's how we wind up with the law that you can fall from literally any height and survive, completely uninjured, just so long as you land in a few inches of water. And so long as you aren't John Marston. 
Even the protagonists of Grand Theft Auto, with their relaxed approach to obeying most laws, were compelled to follow this one. Not a scratch on him. And so, prior to the arrival of GTA V, you could merrily hurl your Grand Theft Auto man off of or out of anything without a care in the world as long as there was a body of water to catch them. He's probably just caught some terrible waterborne disease, but other than that, absolutely fine. But nothing good can last, and reality finally caught up with us in 2013 when along came Grand Theft Auto V and we thought we'd amuse ourselves by bailing out at 10,000 feet into the ocean below. It didn't go so well. Along with the graphical advances, multiple protagonists, and eventual online multiplayer, GTA V gave us a more realistic take on simulating the physics of human bodies versus long drops into the drink, where surface tension, the density of water, and bone-snapping rapid deceleration team up to kill you on impact. Ow! Water? I thought we were friends! You've been talking to gravity, haven't you? They've had it in for me from the start. So there you go, another fine video from outside Xbox. There are many, many more, thousands in fact, uh, for you to watch, but we've selected two of the very best videos we have to offer, and they're on the screen right now. One from us, and one from our sister channel, Outside Extra. So please do watch those, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this, and if you want to be notified every time we make a video, just hit that notification bell. It's easy.